There we go. All right. So just to do a really quick review, I'm going to share that whiteboard. And we'll just go quickly through some of the questions that we're going to cover in our session. So in the bright green corner, we will talk about the use of layers, which sometimes feels unnecessary, but guess what? It's important. Um, this will actually give us a little bit of information on how to snap shapes to a plan and make things perfectly line up. It will also help us make sure that we snap to existing things and, uh, and in general make stuff kind of get manipulated better. Um, by doing that and setting ourselves up, we can actually help snap photos to help build stuff, which in turn helps us perfectly line stuff up and also give us some intentional use of color. Also, using stuff off of photographs, I think is really helpful with layer management. So you can see our diagram is getting another level of complexity here. And we'll use all of that to try to build a scale figure. And we'll also use a scale figure by using an, ex we'll try to use a photo of somebody to make a scale figure and make a better scale figure. All right. I don't know if we'll get a chance to go over curving shapes today, but I know that you guys want to. And so I promise that we will. If we don't do it today, we'll do it in the future. All right. So now we're going to go back to Rhino now that we've got that overview. Share the screen. Go over to Rhino. Can everybody see Rhino? Yep. Sweet. Okay. So I'm going to follow that same general practice that we just went over about how to present your model well. So I just did an overview of what we're going to do in class, but let me give you an overview of the model so that you're familiar with the model space of what I've made. And this also gives me a chance to test out the lag on my computer. All right, so I'm going to zoom extends C space E space. And because I'm presenting on my laptop and recording from my laptop with my laptop's microphone, you guys should actually be able to hear my typing on the computer. You might not be able to hear my clicks on my mouse. So here's Zoom Extents. We're in a parallel projection. We are not in a perspective view. So again, remember that's in set view down here, isometric. That's important. So, <laughs> all right. And yeah, and so an isometric is a parallel projection. There's no perspective. That's really important. And what we're going to use today is we're going to be looking at this. Uh, we're going to be looking at this photograph that I have. This is a photograph of a corbel. And some of you guys have been learning about brick corbeling, where you stack and you can make an arch by kind of shifting the pieces over a little bit each time. But when you do that as an actual architectural detail, it's also called a corbel. And you'll see these in cornices. You'll see these as part of moldings, um, at, like crown moldings. You'll see it as a piece of furniture. So this is a corbel that was drawn up here on the top. That's a corbel that's drawn as a print from 1600 from this guy, Piranesi, who I do a lot of studying with because I like the way that he draws. And also, I think it's interesting to ask questions about like, all right, so we know how they make this in the Renaissance times. How would we make it now in the computer? So we're going to use this as our topic for today. So I've actually edited this image in Photoshop to take a little bit of the perspective out of it but to give it a little bit of an axonometric projection so that you guys can see the, um, so that you guys can see some of the depth. So there's the original image. And then I've taken some information off another piece of the image and added some depth so that I can get some measurements on it. I have it in here using the picture frame command. So that's picture, sorry. And I'm ref I always refer to it by its old command name, which was picture frame. Now the command is just picture. Um, Wherever it is that I'm working on this project, I want the picture, the photograph that I'm using to be saved in the file with the model. Otherwise, I'm going to have to hunt for it. And if I move this to a different computer, I'm going to lose that picture forever. This isn't linked. The JPEG is actually embedded in the model itself. But in case I want to replace it or I accidentally delete it, it's really helpful to ha make sure that you, you have it saved in the same folder. We're actually going to hit escape because my computer is searching for the university server. And it's just going to think for a little bit right now. Um, when I'm starting to get involved with a really detailed model, usually I make like a project folder and I'll have like some photos in there. I might, if I take some sketches, I might scan those or take photos of those sketches and put those in the folder as well. 
as I have iterations of the model, I will save new iterations of the model into this project. You guys can see I actually started building this this time last year. So this is an old model. I have a newer model of this, which you guys don't get to see this time around, but don't worry, it's, uh, it's plenty boring. Okay, so I'm gonna go into my parallel projection and you can see that I spent a lot of time modeling in the parallel view and I have a really lar long elevation view. So this is the model setup I have, but I actually just double click to keep going in and transferring back in these places. I wanna go back to the other view, double click. Same thing here. The top view, I have my grid turned on, but I don't have it on for everything. The other thing that I've done today that I just wanna go over really quickly for a presentation is we went over display options last time and you can actually get a shortcut to display options by just right clicking anywhere in the model that's not, that's not it, right clicking anywhere in the model that's not a, uh, now it's not doing it. It was doing it so well when I practiced before. Now it's just doing save. Well, that's not helpful. So normally when you hit right click, it will repeat whatever the last command is. So right now it's trying to look for the picture frame. But if you don't have a command activated, please, and then Rhino just crashes. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna pause our recording. Okay, we're back. So this is why it's important to save your work because randomly you can ask something to do stuff or type in too many commands, get a little impatient, try to teach your class, not wait for Rhino to finish thinking and your program crashes. <sighs> Luckily I saved everything. So my progress has not been lost. All right, I just wanna go to display properties, also known as display options. And I wanna show you guys that because I have these weird construction lines, I'm actually gonna make my display a little bit grayer. Thank you just so that you guys can kind of see my construction lines a little bit easier. So I'm doing this by going into display options and selecting a solid color background and setting it to be this kind of bluish gray hue, which will make my construct, hopefully will make my construction lines jump out to you a little bit better. So let's go into the workflow first. So you can see I've got these two pictures. I've got a bunch of different models. I have some stuff over here. I have a bunch of construction lines and then I have some 3D model making. If I go into a view here, select everything, zoom makes sense, and just do a turntable. That's way too fast, but if we set this to something like six or 10, that should project a smooth view to you. Dock that over there. So that should pre project a pretty smooth view to you, and we're rotating clockwise right now. I actually kind of prefer a counterclockwise rotation, so we'll do negative 10. All right, so in the left-hand corner of the screen, I've modeled out the material that I'm actually trying to mill this from. So that white rectangle over there is actually my, my block. That's my blank that I'm gonna be modeling from. And the circles over there are the two bit sizes that I can work with, because I wanna use this on the CNC machine to actually mill this out. So to give myself a sense of context and scale, because I'm still working on something that's architectural, but I'm working at it at one-to-one -one scale. That is how big the block of millable mm -hmm. material is. I have a piece of wood and also a piece of milling, milling foam that I can use. Uh, in the middle, I have the kind of unadulterated image that I edited in Photoshop. And so I cut out all of the background. I warped the image to the shape that I needed it to be. I saved it as a good resolution and I actually upped the contrast, not to make it look beautiful, but so that I could extract information from it. And the first set of levels that I'm using in layer management is my construction lines. And you're gonna see that I actually have multiple layers of construction lines. And then finally, on the right-hand side, you can see where I'm using that milling block that I have, and I'm using those bits. And actually up here on the top, I'm lining up how I would use those bits. And on the base, I'm setting up what are the constraints. Because to mill the block, I actually need to put on the CNC machine some things to hold it in place. So, I'm building all of those things that exist in real life so I don't forget that they're there. It's not that I don't believe that, but guys, I started working on this a year ago for a project as a proposal. I needed to make an illustration for the proposal to show that it was viable for it to get accepted. And so this is the, that file. What I'm not gonna show you guys today is the complete file because really what I'm interested in showing you is the process. 
You can also see that I have multiple different iterations of how I made something and all of the process steps that I was in this. So the actual finished process, there's probably 36 steps to this now and it's still not done. But I wanna just show you guys that I was trying to illustrate that it's gonna be multiple steps. Okay, now let's get into it. We spent enough time prepping. So let's go to this parallel view over here on the right hand side. So one of the photographs that I selected right here, I'm gonna move you guys to a smaller view. I actually can control the transparency of the surface a little bit. So I've made it a little bit less transparent and a little kind of milky in the photo that I uploaded so that I can draw over it. If we look at my layer management here, you'll see that I have a lot of layers. I've actually deleted, I've deleted all of the other layers that usually come as a default. I've left the default layer, but I have, let's just make this a little bigger so you can read them. I have construction lines, I have construction, double zero construction lines, triple zero construction lines, construction cylinders, and construction paths. I also have something I just called geom geometry and baseball. Now that seems like overkill, but I started out with two sets of construction lines and started getting more and more and more. Um, as we're looking at this, let's see if we can go to the left view. There we go. As we're looking at this, I want you guys to see that like, I actually started tracing out the circles in yellow. And as I zoom way in, my sketch, the drawing that I'm working from gets really pixelated. But as I'm starting to build things like construction lines, double click to make that ready, I can say, all right, we're gonna use these three and I'm gonna sketch something that goes from this circle and kind of clicks along that circle right there. Might actually have to turn off the ortho. So I'll turn off snap. So it stops snapping to everything. And I'll just say, all right, so this circle kind of is all of these pieces. This circle is actually really hard to understand, but I'm gonna say it's about that big. And I'm gonna keep on making those construction lines just until I get an understanding for like how big this overall piece is. So here, where I don't even have a complete circle, it might be really helpful to grab that and then say copy and just check to see if these all line up. And I could turn on the ortho if I wanna keep them moving in a straight line. So one of the questions was, how do I keep stuff moving in a straight line? Well, turn on and, orth turn on and off ortho as you need it to go. So here I can just kind of keep on saying, every time there's a line, I'm gonna click with the copy command. So I'm gonna build up a rich amount of those things. I can't see them right now in the left-hand view, but let's go back over to the right view. And you can see I've got a bunch of those right there. Now, it's really hard to look at the photograph and the model at the same time. As a matter of fact, like my brain is kind of like too much information, too much information. So the first thing that I did was make sure that this photograph is on its own layer. And that way also, it keeps me from grabbing that photo by accident. Uh, and I can do that by hitting this little lock right here and locking that layer. So now it's there, but I can't select it, which is also helpful. So let's just turn off that photo layer and look at the construction lines that we have. And you can see that there's a lot of different circles because since it's a spiral, the circles actually fade into each other, but there's some small circles and some big circles. There's also a lot of different center lines and different axes of symmetry that exist on that as well. And you can see this is why I needed to have different construction lines. Now, this is a little bit tough because normally when you select a shape, it highlights in yellow. So making a layer that's yellow is really hard because you don't know when you've selected it. But because my other construction lines are orange, I've decided to make other construction lines magenta and other construction lines yellow. This also gives me an order and appearance for what they are. So yellow circles have to deal with the radii of my details in the drawing. Orange construction lines are axes. And since these are neither of those, I will, make, I will select them and right now I will change the layer that they're on. Now remember, to change layer, all you have to do is say change layer and select the layer that you want it to be on. There you go. 
again, that's change layer, select that property. It's gonna ask you, and if you're not sure what to do, you don't even have to have stuff selected, watch this. Remember when you go to change layer, it'll actually tell you up in the upper left-hand corner of the selection box, it'll tell you in the command line, select the objects to layer change. So we can select them or we can select them one at a time. If you need to keep building them up, you can just keep selecting. If you select something by accident, don't worry. Just hold control and click it at the same time, it'll take it away. You can also hold control and use the box select by clicking and holding, all right? Now, let's just change this one other way. Let's say that we want this one on a yellow layer because we are actually tracing a radius. We could use the change layer command, but I can also do this. I can right click on it and it'll bring up I'm gonna, I'm gonna select this guy and we can go over here to the properties. So right now I have the little layer cake command turned on. But let's look at this, uh, let's look at this rainbow wheel. And this will change to the properties of whatever it is that I've selected. And remember, this is Rhino, so you can always do things five different ways. So I'm gonna select this and you can see that it says it's a closed curve. The color is displayed by layer and it's on the layer zero zero construction line. So I can click this little drop down menu and say, I now want you on that layer. And you can see that it changes. And we can do it again and change it again. That's kind of handy. Uh, don't freak out, your layers are still over here by the little uh, French flag pie chart. And we can still turn our photo back on and it's right there. Now, once we've made all of this stuff, let's make a copy of this so that we can use it as a model. So we're gonna go over here and Will, I'm gonna mute you just so that you're not, uh, the motorcycles in the background aren't distracting us. No problem. Uh, all right, we're gonna go to the parallel command. My photos are already turned off. And this is again, why the layers are so important. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off all the layers except the ones that we wanna select. Now, Minwoo was doing this earlier by hiding, but I'm just gonna turn stuff off. So I'm gonna walk my way down the project until I've turned off everything that I don't want. And that way I only have what I want. So here are my axes and my circles and I've got everything else turned off. And I'm gonna box select this and make sure my ortho is turned on and I'm gonna copy it and move it over. Now, this is actually gonna lock, <coughs> excuse me, onto one of the axes, depending on how I'm biasing my view. If you're worried about that and you'd rather just move away from that and you wanna just move it in a more controlled axis, you can make sure that your gumball is turned on and you can use it this way and you can move it by just grabbing that arrow. But if you, I'm gonna, if you hold control down, it'll move the axes outside of it. And if you hold alternate down, it'll make a copy. So here's what I'm gonna do again. I'm gonna box select it. The gumball shows up. My computer lags a little bit. I hold alternate down. I click on the green arrow. I'm gonna move it way out here. And now I have a copy of it. Let's go back to the layer and turn everybody back on. I can do this one at a time, or I can just hold shift, click on everybody, hit the light bulb, and there everybody is. Remember, the light bulb is whether or not you can see it, and the lock button is whether or not it's locked. So I can also select everything by selecting just this layer, and that's kind of handy too. Um, if I want to keep all this stuff over here, but I want to hide it, I could also move this onto its own layer. So I could just say, Let's call this a new layer and let's call it level 80 diagrams and we'll make them ridiculous green. Uh, yeah, ridiculous green. And we can go to properties and just say, I want, see, you'll see it here at layer, well, it varies, but I wanna move them all to ridiculous green. And there I've got something I could export. Like there I have a diagram of the layers of symmetry and the different radiuses from this picture. So for example, if you were doing a history project and you wanted to interrogate it for a lot of different layers of stuff, I find it's really easy to do pretty circles in the computer, a lot harder to do it by person. So if I wanted to do a lot of iterations fast where I didn't really matter to me and I wanted to practice for another class, I would do it in here and that would help me edit it. And then I would do a nicer drawing 
whether it was in the computer or by hand, because that's usually how I work. Okay, so we've got lots of different construction lines. You guys can see that there's now a hierarchy of construction lines, which is better than just a ton of construction lines. So Mitch's rule of architecture, construction lines are your friends. And taking Mitch's, rules, Mitch's rule of architecture to the second degree, more construction lines are your friends. And to the third degree, a hierarchy of construction lines are definitely your best friends. So we've got that here. Now we can start building some cylinders. So I've done that. And even more importantly, I can start building a spiral. Now, you guys asked about curvy shapes. So here's how we're gonna do curvy shapes. So up here, here's the circle command. Here is the oval command. Here is the arc command in the upper left-hand side. But there's another one, and this is actually my favorite. In AutoCAD, we call these splines or SP lines. Because remember, a curve is a polyline. It's a multi-parted line is a polyline. So a smooth polyline or a spline, which is actually a shipbuilding term, there's a lot of different ones. So here's a control point curve. I'm just going to show you what that looks like. Here's a control point curve. Uh, and let's do it in a let's do it in a regular view. Let's do it in a plan view just so that you can see it. So here's a control point curve. And you can see it's kind of stretching in between them. Here is a through the points curve where no matter how it curves, it has to go through those control points. And you'll see in a moment how these behave differently. And then here's a, um, let's change, hang on, let's change this background so you guys can see this better. Uh, properties. Let's make these guys red. Ooh. There we go. So they show up a little bit better. And let's do one more, which is a curve with a handle. All right, so go back to select. Whenever we grab a curve or an object, you see that we get this gumball with a central point to it, that central white dot. But these curves operate differently. So if we select them, you'll see that they have these control points that exist out here. Rather than a point in the center, like this cube, this is made up of all of its control points around it. Still has a central point with the gumball, but it's got these pieces too. You see that this one, which was made by the points that it passes through, those points are actually now interpolated on the outside. And this one, which is made with handles, they're even further out. So there's three different ways to make them. They all behave as splines, but they kind of, they kind of look a little bit different as you uh, manipulate them. The more you manipulate these lines, the more they'll all be the same. This will make more sense as you practice with them. So, I can grab this thing and I can move it around, but I can also grab the points and I can move those around. And you can see that that will actually control these pieces. Let me turn off ortho. And let's just grab it here. And let me turn off the gumball for just a minute so that you can just see that I can grab those points, click and hold, and I can move them around. Now, this is really nice if you want to like kind of slowly finesse something like to make this, let's see, see how this is kind of square right now. I can kind of move it to be a little bit more custom. And there's a benefit to that, and there's a detraction from that. So as I make this more custom, it's less and less repeatable. It's more and more completely unique. And sometimes it's good to be unique, and sometimes it's good to be kind of mass repeatable. So as I make this spiral more and more custom, it's more and more specialized and it's more and more computing power. The more I make this kind of smart by selecting it to known radii of circles, the easier it is for the computer to calculate it. So let's select down here. And I'll just show you guys. So here, this one was made by this one was made by these control points that are really close to it. So you can see that it stays pretty close. This is made by these control points that kind of flex through it. Now, mathematically, you guys are familiar with some of these things because this this point where the dashed line crosses across it is where this curve goes from being concave to convex. That's called the inflection point in mathematics. 
That doesn't matter to us from a mathematical point of view, but as designers, it means that this is where the curve goes from feeling one shape to another shape. And then let's do this one that was made with handles. And the handles no longer exist, but you can see that the inflection point is actually, this curve is made with a dimple or a cusp, might be another way of describing it. And this cusp, so this is still a polyline, but this cusp here, when the dashed line is close to it, you don't see the cusp. And when the dashed line is far away from it, you see it as an angle. It all depends on the way that these have been made. Now, this whole thing is an object, this whole thing is an object, and they have different properties. Let's just go back to making the one with the handle one more time so you can see how it's different. As I click, you impart an energy to it. You basically do a half of its length, and then you can stretch it. And the more that you stretch towards that base, it's skinnier or it's longer, and then you impart more energy to that curve again, and it's skinnier or it's longer, and again. And if I don't move at all, it stays flat. And when I collect, select it this first time, I can actually grab the energy in that line and change it. So I can make sharp things, I can make concave patterns, I can make them swoop across themselves. Now, if you want to bend your brain even just a little bit more, check this out. Select one of these, go over here into the front view, turn the gumball on, and move one of them in, select one of these control points and move it into three dimensional space. And all of a sudden, that line has become an incredibly complex object. It's an object that can only be described by being in three dimensional space. This can really kind of mess with your noggin. Right now, it looks like a two dimensional object, but let's do that zoom selected and let's do the turntable command again. And you can see that it is a rather complex object. It's a roller coaster. Now, this is really helpful, but you can get into a lot of trouble really fast by being inaccurate. So really what we need is a scaffolding to attach this to. Imagine that you were trying to bend a piece of wire. You could either eyeball it, or you could kind of make a box that holds it. And having some construction lines is really helpful. So let's, let's go back to the highly controlled object that I was trying to make over here in the diagram. And then we'll take a break, I promise, because this is long and listening to my voice can be droning. So I'm gonna select, I don't know which one is the best one to use, but I'm gonna select curve with interpolated points rather than a curve through control points. And the objective is to start here and move my way out through these consecutive rings until I hit the outermost ring and then flex it back and then spiral in on itself again. So let's turn on snap. That way it'll grab at these points. And you can see that the reason why I have these lanes of symmetry is so that I can actually grab and snap to each one of these along the intersection. So let's start here. And let's work our way. Oh. And we've immediately broken, broken Rhino. It's all right, practice. It's all about practice. So let's start from here and curve out through these points. There we go. Now they're behaving themselves a little bit better. Come on, buddy. There we go, out along the curve, and then out further. And you can see to really make it behave itself, it's gotta be a slow progression. It's gonna look really ugly before it looks beautiful. Yep, this looks super ugly. I'm out of practice, I don't have the rhythm of this model. It's all right though. I'm not totally flustered. We're gonna just, we're just gonna embrace, we're gonna embrace the suck. And we're gonna get weird. All right, so I'm gonna just end the spiral out here. Let's move that guy onto a layer that's more visible against this super green. And I'm gonna move it onto my, my loop layer. There, it shows up as blue. Okay, so that's, we'll call that janky. Now, I could adjust it here by slowly grabbing these and moving them. 
or I could, you know, I could embrace the suck and be like, you know what? I need more practice. And uh, I'll be honest with you guys. I think I need more practice. So I'm going to turn that layer off. And I'm going to move into the construction line because I'm finding the orange against this background is hard to see. And instead of doing the through the control points, I'm going to try a different, a different one. I'm going to try to say, rather than interpolate, let's go with control points. All right, so we're going to start the line out here. We're going to move through these layers and then slowly out. And I'm going to try to do more control points to give me more control. And then I'm going to work my way out the spiral by clicking on each one of these over and over. And I can see, actually, I'm getting more information here right now. I can see that it's actually helpful to have kind of an escape spiral. And I'm missing a very important construction line, which is this construction line along the horizontal right here. So you can see that this one is getting to be more oval. And I'm also seeing that if I don't hit each and every one, or if I select to the wrong intersection, I've got a real problem. So here we go. Check this out. Um, so I'm missing a horizontal control point, so I'm getting this squished sphere, this squish oval. So that's good information to know. And I'm also, so I need to make sure that I have that piece right here. So I'm going to grab this, copy, and paste it over into here so we have control on both sides. And I'm going to turn off some of my snaps. So I'm going to go to O snap, and I'm going to say, turn off center points because it keeps selecting to the center of my circles. So I'm gonna select that off. I'm gonna move this guy, change layer. I'm gonna move him to the Boolean loops, which is gonna turn him off. Don't worry, he's still there. Still mess, still got process. But let's do this one more time to make a controlled curve. And let's go back to interpolate points. So I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna, actually fade into what it is that I want to make there. And then I'm going to work my way around the circle to an exit trajectory. And I'm going to loop out, work my way around the circle, and then exit, work my way around the circle, and exit. And this is just to do a controlled spiral. Now, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if you're thinking, Andrew, maybe there's a spiral command. And you know what? You'd be right. And actually, that was my first stop. And I didn't show you guys that because what I found is that Piranesi is really tricky. And he doesn't do what you're expecting to do. So your eye sees spiral, but actually it's not a spiral. And that's the crux of what I think is interesting about him, is that he draws these things that you think are interesting, and you think they're simple, and it turns out they're not so simple. So let's work our way around the spiral. And you can see that with more control points and from learning by it not going the way I wanted it to the first couple times, I'm actually having a more su successful spiral loop happening here. And I'm gonna inflect it. And we're gonna come in for a landing over here. And we're gonna call a win a win and stop with this big loop out here. So let's look at that. Look at the amount of control lines and control points that exist here. But do you see how the construction lines have given me more thought, more control, and more precision as I kind of am drawing this spider web? Let's turn that Boolean loops back on to look at it. And you can see the, the good versus the bad versus the ugly. We need the ugly stuff to get to the good stuff. Now that I have that, let's move into three-dimensional space and see if we can put that thing to work. Zoom, makes sense, zoom, selected, zoom, selected. No objects are selected, fine. Zoom, selected, there it is. And let's copy that out here. And let's take some of those janky ones. I'm gonna hit Alt and pull him out. And I'll zoom in and grab the first one that we did. So 
other one that we did. There we go. And now we can see the process of how we built what we built in kind of our family portrait that we've got there. And we actually have an axiometric diagram. I could even pull out some of the important diagram lines. Hit Alt, pull this out to here. And we can see how important some of those pieces were. And if I just wanted to look at just these guys alone, I could pull these guys over here and I could just take that, just that one. And now I could clean it up without the circles being present. So I could kind of move these around to even it out a little bit more. The other thing, last thing I wanna say is remember how I started and ended with this really weird tail? I'm gonna make a rectangle. I'm gonna use that rectangle to trim this piece down. So I'm gonna make put a rectangle there and I'm gonna put a rectangle here. And actually using ortho, I'm gonna snap that rectangle to that shape. I'm gonna use that rectangle to trim off those guys. Oh, and right there is why you don't want a model in a perspective, because it looked like I was building it here, but in fact, I was building it in that plane. All right, so let's go back to our right view, zoom out, zoom in, and use a rectangle and a planar view. That'll be a lot better. That guy goes to here. That guy goes to here. And I'm gonna snap it to that location and then move it along one axis at a time, hold shift, there we go. We're gonna use the trim command Follow the instructions up here, select the cutting object, this one, select the object to be cut. There we go. Uh, and I can say trim command again, select the cutting object, uh, extend cutting lines, apprentice cutting lines, no, select the cutting object, there we go. And actually it'll say um, parent intersections, yes, and you can say select object to select trim. And now you can see that that's been cut and the, the control lines have been simplified. So there is how you make curves. And a spiral is actually simultaneously one of the simplest and most complex curves that you can make because everything is a variation on an inflected spiral. Every single curve is a variation on a concave curve, a convex curve, and a curve with an inflection. It's one of the reasons why we find that general shape, which is called a French curve, that shape, which is two curves inflecting on each other so visibly kind of like good in the feels. This has all been about construction lines on three different levels in five different hierarchies that show some process and how we can use these. Of course, we don't even need to make 2D. This thing that I've just selected, we could export as a DWG or as a .ai file and open it in Illustrator. I don't care that they're ridiculous colors. It actually makes them easier to edit once I take them into Illustrator. So if I took these into Illustrator, these layers would show up in Illustrator. And I could make all of them. And actually, if I was going to take this to Illustrator, I would do one more layer. Zero, zero, one. Construction axes. Let's set the color to be a reddish orange. Like that. Change layer, select the objects to change. I would grab all of these axes. So I'd grab this one, this one, hold down shift, keep adding all of these. Change layer, construction path, down here, construction axes. There we go. All right. And then all of these different axes would show up on their own layers in Illustrator. And I could just say, this one needs to be really thick. Everything on construction axes is gonna be really thick. Everything in construction circles is gonna be dashed. Everything that's a spiral that wasn't the final one on the show is gonna be a dotted line. And the final one on this curve is gonna be darkest. One of the reasons that you guys will see in my layer management is I actually put numbers ahead of everything. Sometimes I'll even go to triple zero, and that gives me an immediate hierarchy. So when I say name, it moves everything into it. My 
triple zero and double zeros are always construction lines. They're always, for me, a color scheme of orange. And then I have these other things that are more detailed and they're on different layers. I usually put my 900 or 90 layer is where my photos are. And that way it makes it easy. The photos are always at the bottom and I can turn them on and off. Okay, what does this all have to do with a skilled person? Well, that's a fantastic question and I'm glad that you asked it because that's the last thing that we'll do before I stop sharing my screen. So let's get a picture of a person waving, a uh, full body person wave, because my sail figures are always waving at each other. So let's go to images. Let's go to something that's a pretty robust picture of a person. Let's try to get like a full body of a person waving. Um, and rather than saying full body, let's say uh, construction wave. All right, this guy's got a lot of attitude and I like that, but that watermark means that it's a copyrighted image. So let's go to all and let's go to my favorite place for open source imagery, Wikimedia Commons. And let's go to somewhere where we know that we can use it. We're gonna search the Wikimedia Commons. We're gonna say waving person, waving human. Now, this is not going to give us the best thing right, right off the bat. All right, let's say surfing, because when you surf, you wave automatically. All right, so we're going to look at pictures of people surfing. Excellent. And we need somebody who's the entire, we need a picture of the entire person, and that's the other nice thing about somebody surfing. Oh, this one might work. Here's a person paddling. I like that. Here's multiple people, but there's spray in the way. Yep, we're gonna go with this one. We're gonna open this image in a new tab, but first I'm gonna back up and we're gonna look at the copyright information for this person. Because I don't wanna just check it out. I wanna see the extra data, so more details. All right, let's look down at this and let's see. Date, author, Bios license under the Creative Commons attribution and share alike. So that we means that. Go ahead, Morgan. Sorry. Um, we can't see the screen. Oh, guys, I'm so sorry. New share. Share my screen. So check it out. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. All right, sorry. That's more helpful. So, guys, I did Google and I tried to share people. Let me just back up here. So I just shared like waving people and like I got a bunch of like rando stuff like this. That was not helpful. So I went actually to Wikimedia where everything is usually share with attribution. There's nothing that's copyrighted on Wiki Commons. It's usually share or share with attribution. So what we found here under surfing is that we get these pictures of full body people doing something that's kind of active, which is kind of nice. So I scrolled down and I found like this one, right? Now, unfortunately, if I make her a scale figure, we'll be missing her foot. So we want somebody who we get their whole foot. And if I make this guy a scale figure, he's gonna have this strange protuberance. So I like this one right here, scale person with paddle. And I'm looking at the details. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this and I make a bookmark of this. So it's by Anna Farias from Brasilia. I'm gonna copy that information for a minute. And I'm gonna download a pretty good picture of this, but not the full, not the full one right here. Save image. I'm gonna save this to my desktop, but you ought to save this to your, you know, to your file where your Rhino file is. And while that's going, while we're waiting for my computer to find that, I'm going to do the text command. And I'm going to paste the author's information right there. And we're gonna put it on the default layer and we're gonna make it big and we're gonna make it a height of one foot. You won't see it right now, but it will show up here. There it is. Let's scale it up. Hmm. 
I'm gonna make sure that I keep that person's name so that we can say thank you to Andrea, my Brazilian counterpart. All right, and we'll go back here. Has it figured out where the save command is yet? Wait, it has. Oh, it's there. Saving, standing up, awesome. It's saved, we'll go back to Rhino and we're ready to do a picture frame view. So, go here to the right view screen. We're gonna do picture. It's gonna bring up this command. I'm gonna put the guy in right here. Now, interesting challenge. Remember, I told you guys this thing is in one-to-one -one space. So what I wanna do right now is make a rectangle that is six feet tall. It's automatically coming in that that is six feet tall. Now your buildings are, your models are gonna be much larger because I'm making a detail. But I'm going to take this person and put his foot, snapping it at the bottom right there. I'm gonna hit the scale command. We're gonna say scale. And it's gonna say, enter the base point. And I'm gonna actually use the snap to the bottom of that as the base point. Then I'm gonna click on his head. I'm gonna scale it to the top of that. So now this picture, this, this figure is actually six feet tall in the model. Now, since this is a small photo, it's still actually relatively small. And now what I'm gonna do is I am going to use the spline but let's put him on his own layer, scale figure layer. And we'll do that in the, let's see, that's in the 90s, so we'll do it 95. Scale figure, make it orange. And here's what we're gonna do. Through the control points, turn off, snap. And we're just gonna quickly trace Skill figure. Now, here's the question. How much level of detail do you want to have? Too much detail and it'll take forever. Not enough detail and it'll look real weird. You control the level of detail and I, I, this is, if I was watching this right now, it would make me seasick, but you control the level of detail by adding these points. I'm trying to add these points wherever his body and flex. Get a little personal right there, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. The inseam, all right, and flex across the calf muscle. Down here, the feet are gonna look real weird. I wanna try to do it in an efficient amount of points. More detail around his hand. Now we don't need to be in a hyper amount of detail because this is just for demonstration purposes, but let's make sure that we get around his eye. And then we're gonna close the loop by turning the snap back on so that we grab that last point. There we go. Now I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna, tur I'm gonna make sure that this is on that photo layer. So let's put change layer and let's put it down on the photography layer, okay. We'll turn the photo layer off. And guys, I've got a scale figure. Copy and paste them over here. Now, what we need to do is create a surface. There's a couple different ways that we can do this. Since it's a closed shape, we could use the cap command. If I make that a shaded view, that ought to work, but it doesn't always. Nope. Over here and paste, we can use this cap command. Let's see if it works. Sometimes it works. Select the surfaces to cap, enter. Nope, didn't like it. Fine, play that way. Another thing that we can do is we can say extrude. And there was a question about this, which is like, how do you extrude from a line? So we can say extrude a curve. And you can see that this will actually extrude it as a volume. So if we wanna make like a paper thin man, I could do that. And that actually gives me an extruded surface. So I've got a scale figure in there. Uh, if I took a little bit more time to make his other, the opening where his elbow is against his body, he wouldn't look like he's, uh, he's got a strange beer belly in the reverse direction. 
but we've got a little bit of a person doing an action, which is really helpful. But the other reason why it's helpful is that I've been showing you guys this model all afternoon and you didn't have a feeling for how big the piece was that I was making. So now by introducing a scale figure, let's turn that, let's turn that photo off. And introducing this work piece, you guys can now see that this scroll, this corbel that I'm making, which is this piece right here, we'll copy it. I'll move it up. You can see that the detail of the sketch is actually really, really fine. And the thing that I'm making can either be 3D printed or CNC manufactured, but really it's big enough to hold in your hand, which immediately gives you a different way of thinking about how big that piece is. All right, I'm gonna just zoom out for a minute. That's been enough to go over, I think, for one day. And we'll do some questions. What kind of questions do you guys have about, let me see, we did, we did splines, we did extrude from curve, we did hierarchy of construction lines, we did some layer management, and we even went over how to make a scale figure, which is also an extrude along a curve. And we talked about levels of detail. What do you guys got? Who's got a question? It's really cool. Actually, um, I while you were doing that, and I was following along, I created a little Google Docs uh, spreadsheet where I was thinking maybe as a class we could put different commands that we use all the time. So that's right. Different. That was an idea that we had last week, and that's what we should be doing. I love that idea because it would show me how much you guys are exploring. And, uh, and you can tag your name if you've used a command. I love that idea. Will, could you share that in the, uh, in the chat? Yeah. I'm doing it right Google now. Drive accessible to us in the all all person folder. Yeah, everyone should be able to use that. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Cool stuff. I'm gonna just open that up for a minute and you guys should be able to see that. There we go. So you know you can put stuff in here, such as uh, like the turntable command. And what I would love actually is I would love to just put one more command in here, one more row in here. Mm -hmm. um, where you could sign your name to it, Will. Okay, sure. Because that would be really helpful for me. And if somebody else has found it, if you can put your name in alongside it and you've used it, that would be great because then I can start to see what tools you guys like using the most or who's doing a bunch of experimenting or who's using a weird combo set. And that would be really helpful. And, you know, there's these multiple commands that you can use and that's also helpful. But if you just kind of put in the different commands that you've been using. Now, you don't have to have this up live as you're working, but if you just keep track of it, and I've been asking you guys to draw when you get stuck, if you just keep a map of the tools that you're using, that would be really helpful. Let's go over a little bit of the homework and maybe that'll elucidate some of the questions. So the homework for, third, for Wednesday, sorry, for Wednesday, the homework is to go in and make sure that you have a robust level of commands. And I want you to build 2D diagrams. So just like I did with all of these construction axes that are down here, I want you to build out diagrams. So axes of maybe symmetry, of curvature, of maybe flow or circulation through your small space. And I recommend that you build these diagrams not in a three-dimensional view, but rather build them in a top-down plan view here, like this. So you can build diagrams this way and build them in your front and right elevations. Um, which means that you can look at different diagrams and you can have those available to share on Wednesday. As a matter of fact, I would like you to take three screen captures, three screen captures. So for example, let's go to the right view right here and I can go to this and we can actually say screen capture to quick clipboard and you can do screen capture to file. This is a really fast way to grab stuff that's, that's low quality, that's easy to share screen capture to file. Will, you can put that in your Google Doc right now. Screen capture to file. Screen capture to file is a horrible way to come up with renderings. It's an excellent way to share stuff quickly. And what I would like you guys to do for homework is to have what you think is your best or most interesting or most highly evolved diagram as your background on Wednesday when we have class. All right, so you can drop it in as your, as your background. 
So the first part of the homework is to do a robust set of layer management. And I find it's actually easy once you get, once you get into it is to go back into here and you can start doing like, you know, levels of hierarchy. So we could do level 20 diagram, biggest circles, and we could make them color cyan and we could go in and we could select them. Change layer. And you could actually start doing it right here like that to build out your diagram. And we could do things like display properties. And we could say we want the background to be, well, if we're coal, we'll make the background black. And we could also turn this grid off if we didn't like this grid. And then we can select these. And it'll mostly be based off of color. So also for Wednesday, you'll practice kind of setting these for color. So right now, all these colors are super ridiculous, right? There's like brilliant red, obnoxious green, ecto Kool-Aid, um, cyan and magenta. And instead, what you could do is you could adjust these colors. So once you get everything on a layer, you can adjust these colors to be a more simpatico color set. So I can start adjusting these. to being more kind of complementary with each other. All right, and I can start controlling those a little bit better. By turning snap on and off, I could even do some more adjustments. And actually, I find really good diagrams are a combination of construction lines and then lines that you actually draw. So for example, if there's a line over here that you really want to emphasize, now would be the chance to go in here and then kind of make sure that I'm drawing it with extra emphasis to get the proper emphasis on the right salabi. Yes, I just referenced that movie. It's a horrible movie, but anyway. So I can kind of build that out and get a hierarchy there. I'm gonna delete those because they're not smart. Um, you can always go to display properties. And remember, this is recorded and I will put this up on YouTube and we'll call it, uh, we'll call it construction lines and layer management. And you can always go into display properties and actually set what you want your background color to be. So you could set your background color to be, you know, something really loud, or it could have a hue, whatever is easiest on your eyes. If you want something to be kind of pastel, or you'd rather it was kind of a gray color, or you just want it to be white. All right, save that and have it as your background to turn in for homework for class. But save three so that you're ready to share them for breakout room um, so that we can ask the same questions that we did today. Now, for my project, it's a tiny detail. So the diagrams are much smaller. For your project, it's about building context and environment. So I'm going to expect you guys to build the street, the lot, the neighbors, the fabric or grain of buildings that you think are around it. So there's, uh, there's gonna be, think about it as, as rings of an onion. Tiny in on the onion, there's lots and lots of little rings close together. As the onion grows and gets bigger, those rings also get really big, which is why like the first onion ring that you get when you order fried onion rings is always like massive and way too big. But as they go out, the level of detail decreases. And as you go in, the level of detail increases. So think about that as you're building out your diagrams. And whether it's helpful to think about it in terms of the details that you're looking at in history class, or the details that you're looking at by making the site analysis and site map that you're doing. Think about the level of detail that you're, you're interested in. And you can use either of those classes to help inform your small space, which is the project we're doing here at this. I'm just gonna check the chat, see if there's more questions. Exactly what are we diagramming? All right, so your small space, it has hierarchy. It has open and closed spaces. A lot of you were talking about light. A definite diagram that you could make is the places where you took photographs from when you made your three-dimensional object. You spoke about all of where your photographs are from. You could make cones of vision from where you're at. What are some other things that you guys could make diagrams of if you start to think about what those diagrams could be? What are other things that you've made diagrams of in the past? Help Peter out, guys. I guess you could do a diagram of like circulation through your space. Sure. And you could actually do, um, are any of you guys familiar with, there's been so many hurricanes this, uh, this season. Have you guys seen this? It's called a spaghetti plot. This is, this is a, 
one of my favorite circulation diagrams, spaghetti plot for a king. So these are all the likely paths that a hurricane will take. These are all the different models. And actually they found that it's better, rather than relying on one model, they do lots of models and they show with pretty good predictability the percent chance. So if most of the models say that it's gonna hit Carolina, then that's a 90% chance is gonna hit Carolina rather than picking any one single plot. For example, here is the hurricane forecasts for an entire year. It's called the spaghetti, spaghetti plot or a spaghetti circulation. Um, this is really, really helpful in terms of a diagram because usually there's not one way that people move through your project. There's multiple ways that you move through your project. Think of all the different ways that you go get food at Canbar. It really depends on what time it is, how many people there are. Your individual path will deviate so that you avoid other people. So this could be a really valuable way of doing circulation. What's another thing that we could diagram besides circulation? I want to hear somebody besides Will. Um, I put in the chat, you could do like, kind of like the wind pattern or like circulation of it. Sure. Like the weather or um, even like where the shadow, like where it would cast shadows. Totally. The day. And actually that's great too, because I'm going to tell you guys that I want you guys to build out your diagrams. I want to actually you to build your diagrams, not just with lines, but with objects. And let me show you one more way that you can supercharge your diagrams in Rhino. All right, can everybody see my rhino? Let's see, I'm gonna take that as an affirmative. I'm gonna take the silence as an affirmative. So yes. we're, gonna, we're gonna go here. And I'm gonna show you guys a brand spanking new tool. I wasn't planning on doing this today, but it's time. So I'm gonna do a circle. I'm gonna start out with a circle. Circle along the midpoint. We're gonna snap to there and we're gonna make it like that. All right, and I'm gonna do extrude along a curve. And we're actually gonna do, yeah, we're just gonna start out with extrude along a curve, but you can see that there's a bunch of these, extrude surface to a tapered point, extrude surface along a curve, extrude surface to a point, extrude taper. We're just gonna start with this one. Select the curve to extrude. I'm gonna select the circle, press enter when done, and I can extrude it along a, cur a distance. Hang on, let me move my... So you can see that it'll, I'll extrude that piece. We already did that with our person. Extrude. Now I'm gonna do extrude curve along a curve. I'm gonna select this curve and select the curve to extrude. Oh, hang on. Select curve to extrude, press enter when done. Select the path. And if you see that, it actually extrudes the circle along that path. Now the weird thing is, is that you can see that it's actually flat because it's extruding it, but it's not actually rotating the circle as it extrudes it. So it's kind of butt ugly. Extrude. Looks like a, you know, one of those deflated tires. Yep. Um, we can also extrude curve along a curve. And if we match this thing to here, Extrude, extrude, curve along a curve. Okay, select the curve to extrude, enter. Select the path and let's look at the options. And you can say split it tangents to the boundary, sub the curve, delete the imperfect solid, no. Uh, split it tangents to the boundary. Select the boundary surface, no. What we really want is to, uh, Along, it's called along a rail. Shoot curve along a rail. So we curve along a curve, curve to a point. Yeah. Hey Andrew. Yeah. Um, when do you plan to share the link for this video with us? Um. So right after right after we're done with class, I will start uploading it. It usually takes about twenty to thirty minutes for it to upload, and then I will share it on the group me. Um, as a really dumb YouTube without a splash page. And you guys will have it via YouTube through the grouping in about a half an hour. Okay, thank you. Right. So- Are you thinking of sweep, Andrew? That's what I'm thinking of, thank you. Brain fart, remember I was telling you guys, it's like, there we go, sweep. 
which is basically selecting along a rail. All right, so here we go, sweep, select a rail. So we're gonna call this curve a rail and select the curve cross section, enter when done, scene point, and there we go. That's what I want. This is even more pretty. Now, do you guys see how extrude along a curve was ugly? But this is, first of all, I've got a lot of options here. And we're going to use that beautiful turntable command. You guys can see that it's a much more robust, more interesting, kind of more controlled way of extruding. And you can actually sweep multiple objects along a rail. So in this instance, the rail is the construction line. And the extrusion is the shape that I made that intersects that construction line. And you can make it even more complex, but basically this allows you to kind of paint in three dimensions by making shapes. And you can make shapes intersect with other shapes by just adjusting this a little bit to say ghosted or, so let's make this ghosted. And you can see where it intersects with itself. Or if we do, let's see, if we do technical, or x-ray, you will get all of the geometry that goes into that as well, which can be really, really funky, especially when we turn on turntable. You can see kind of the richness of what's happening to build out in that geometry, which in and of itself can start the next diagram. And a good model asks a question that the next model will answer. So if you're not sure what to do, you can do something simple like this, and then you can try to redraw that diagram as part of your diagram. This is really just a collection of a bunch of circles every time it shifts its tangent. Okay, so for homework, three screen captures, a diagram is your background, a kind of reiteration of your layers, and oh yeah, there's one really important question that you guys wanted to answer, and we only have 30 seconds to answer it, which is how to make a site. And it's really easy. Because our site is just a cube, all you have to do is make a Site, all you have to do is make a layer called site, snap it to the ground, make your rectangle as big as you want it to be, extrude it out, and there we go. If you want to make it a little bit bigger, grab it by the gumball here and just yank it to one side. Grab it by the gumball and yank it over or over. Put that on its own layer and you've got a ground plane. I'm gonna just move this to the default layer because I'm running out of time, but the one on the default layer, say okay. And there it is, there is a ground plane and we can put our scale person, let's not sink his feet into the concrete, you've got it. Now, if you guys can have your your small space modeled, diagrammed, screenshotted, and a site model. On Wednesday, I will show you guys how to operate the sun, the site, the project north, and we'll start to get into how we would add some lighting to get some shadows, which will make showcasing it even easier. Steph and Betty already shared this with us, but I'll go over it with a little bit more detail and we'll record that so you guys can have that video as well. Sound good? All right, I'm gonna stop recording here. But if anybody has questions, feel free to hang out and uh...